Hello YouTube, Goddard Radio Moscow here again with another beer review for you, as is usual. For this one we're going to go back to Munich and we're actually going to have a look at one of the breweries who have the licence to produce the Oktoberfest beer. And I've never reviewed anything from this brewery before but it's quite cool because they're the sister brewery of Paulaner. The same guy who owns this brewery also owns the Paulaner brewery. So for this one we're going to have a little look at the Hacker Pschor Brau and have a taste of the Münchner Hell beer. I have reviewed a Münchner Hell before and that was the Paulaner one so if you want to have a look at that review just go into my channel and search Paul Lanner and you should find it uh, but as is usual with my beer reviews I'll just take you through a brief history of the brewery tell you a little bit about where the beer comes from but as I always say if you are simply interested in the tasting of this beer then feel free to go on towards the latter part of the video where you will catch that particular segment and I'll try to put a box up here that you can uh, you can have a look at and just that will take you towards the end of the video as well so the history of this brewery goes back to the year 1417 which is the first mention of the Hacker Brewery and it was located at the corner of Sendlinger and Hackstrasse in Munich. But this site today is actually the home of the Altus Hacker House, which is now one of the Hacker Pschor brew pubs. And of course, every brewery in Munich actually has its own brew pub at some point in the city. Some of them, I believe, actually have more than one. But in 1792, brewery servant Josef Schor actually married Maria Theresa Hacker, who was the daughter of the famous brewmaster Peter Paul Hacker. And then Josef Schor actually acquired his father in law's house and brewery. But over the next next 15 years he worked hard and transformed the small Hacker Brewery into one of the top breweries amongst the other 50 or so that were operating in Munich at the time. Now later in 1813 he commissioned the building of the Hacker Beer Fortress which was the largest storage cellar in Germany with an area of 43,000 square feet and a capacity of 30,000 barrels with a depth of 12 metres. But despite the heavy investments required for such, a, for such a feat if you like for the construction of this beer fortress, Josef Schor actually also purchased the, the Boya Hansel Brewery and other buildings in the Neuhausestrasse in, uh, to build the Pschor Brewery in the year 1820. Unfortunately though, Josef Schor died in 1841, but he took his rightful place in the Bavarian Wall of Fame in the Theresienhohe, and he left the brewery to his two sons Georg Sr. and Matthias Pschor Sr. So Georg took over the running of the Pschor Brewery and Matthias the Hacker Brewery. But the breweries actually operated independently but they were very close in proximity to each other and also to the beer fortress which they apparently both used. But both brothers constructed state of the art brewing facilities and they benefited from the connections to the rail network which existed in Munich and this actually allowed them to distribute their beers worldwide and they gained quite a lot of fame with this if you like with their beers. Now in 1864 Franz Strauss and Josephine Strauss gave birth to Munich's favourite composer Richard Strauss. Um, so Georg Pschor Sr. was was actually Richard's godfather and he financially supported Richard at various points in his, to, in his career. So to express his thanks, Richard actually de dedicated the Der Rosen Cavalier uh, to his dear, to quote, his dear relative, the Pschor family in Munich. So the brewery was greatly aided by the invention of the first artificial ice machine from Carl von Lindel and, as, and they'd apparently been using just natural ice before up until 1820, from 1823 but this really made it difficult for them to maintain the constant temperature in this huge beer fortress and I'm sure you can imagine before they had artificial re, uh, refrigeration if you like they would have to transport this ice in from up the mountains and all of that so a really kind of a uh, logistical nightmare if you like. But in 1864 uh, Georg Pschor Jr. actually took over the running of the Pschor Brewery and he initiated a nearly 21 year continuous period of construction and during this time he actually realised his dream of building a new large brewery with the most advanced equipment available but the building was based on modern engineering knowledge and was built on the circular grounds of the summer cellar in uh, Bayerstrasse. But the Pschor Brewery was now actually an industrial company with an annual output that tripled over the course of the move from the Neuhausstrasse to, Bayer, to the Bayerstrasse facility. But during this time the Pschor Brewery actually won a medal at the 1876 World Fair in Philadelphia. So as I mentioned earlier, their beers were getting all across the world even in these early days if you like. But both the Hacker and Pschor Breweries had their troubles from the turn of the 20th century. But they both managed to survive the First World War, the hyperinflation in the early in the 20s in Germany, the Nazi regime and also the Second World War. But in the aftermath of the war, the breweries actually had to share facilities due to the damage to Munich from the Allied bombing raids. However, the push to export the beer continued despite this setback. So in 1972, economic and physical changes to the beer market led to an agreement to merge the two breweries and thus the company became known as Hacker Pschor Breu Aktiengelschaft. 
Acti and Gesellschaft, sorry, I, was, I, wonder, I thought I'd got that word wrong there. But thus there was a reunification of the two traditional brewing companies in Munich who had always really been linked by their founding father, Josef Pschorr. But the beers were actually still sold as separate brands until 1975. And this was, of course, when you started to get the Hack of Pschorr beers with the two crests on the label here from 1975 onwards. Now, in 1979, the brewery changed hands and it was actually bought by the Munich businessman Josef Schorgruber. And he actually still owns the brewery today, but as I mentioned before, they're actually part of the Paulaner Group. And of course, Paulaner took over all of the distribution rights for this beer, both in North America and in Europe. But all beer is brewed in accordance with the Rheinheitsgebot of 1516. And as I mentioned before, they're one of the six breweries within the Munich city limits that are permitted to sell and brew beer for the famous Oktoberfest. And interestingly enough, the Oktoberfest event is actually held on land that was donated to the city by Josef Pschorr. So this brewery is the one who holds the one of the real sort of prominent things, if you like, for the Oktoberfest. These guys were responsible for it in a way, I guess you could say. So to list the other beers that you can get from the brewery, that's your a little history of the Hacker Pschorr Brewery there, but the other beers you can get from Hacker Pschorr actually include the Münchner Hell, which is this guy here, Münchner Gold, the Braumeister Pils, Münchner Dunkel, Münchner Radler, the Hubertus Bock, the Oktoberfest Merzen, the Anno 1417, the Animator, the Superior, Hefeweizen, Dunkelweizen, Lechteweizen, the Sternweizen, and the Naturtrub Keller Beer. And when I was looking up these things on Rate Beer, it always seemed that, it seemed that this brewery has a particular gift for the, uh, the Hefeweizen beers. Apparently those are the best beers to try from that one, but hope, we'll see. Hopefully the, Mu the, the Münchner Hell actually gives us something interesting here. But it's a 5% Hellas beer. I'll just bring up the camera and let you have a little look at the label of this guy. As you can see there, on the top of the label, as I mentioned earlier, it has the crest for both the Hacker, the Hacker Brewery, which is the blue one, and the Peshaw Brauerei, which is the left one there. And you can see it has a picture of some of the Munich landmarks there, which you'll recognise if you've been to the city. And uh, you can see the top label is kind of similar, and it does have the same again on the little pop top here. Apparently, I think it was 2007 or 1997 that they, that they uh, converted to using the sort of traditional pop tops on these beers, if you like. So without further ado, let's get this guy open and get on with the tasting here. That's a good bang on that one, and I can smell the, the kind of grassy and grainy character as I open it there. You can see there was some smoke just coming off of it too. So as you can see, a really kind of pale, clear golden colour. We'll just give it a little bit of a shake and see if we can get some of the aromas out here. A very sweet kind of grassy smelling beer if you, on the, the first impression. But yeah, very sweet, very grassy smelling, quite grainy if you like as well. A lot of grainy bready malts in there. But there's an underlying scent of citrus too, but the most pungent thing definitely is the grassy character. You can see as well, if I put my fingers behind this guy, crystal clear, it's a sort of premium, one of these kind of premium beer colours if you like. There's a lot, just a little bit of uh, bubbles, small bubbles going up towards the top of the head there. And you can see it's a really frothy white head on this beer too. So let's just get the rest of this guy into the glass there. And we'll get on with the tasting part of the beer. You can see it's really, this beer is actually kind of going quite crazy. I'll just see if I can get the last little bit on top there. Getting the typical German head on this guy. Yeah, there we are. A little bit of sedimentation actually coming out of the bottle as I pour the last wee bit in. So let's get this guy closed up and then we can get on with the tasting here. So as you can see, it's a really nice looking beer, like I mentioned it's crystal clear, a pale golden straw is probably the best way to describe it. A nice frothy two finger head once I've got it all out there, that does actually have some bumps in it now that I've poured the last bit in. There was some sedimentation just coming out of the bottle too. So without further ado, I've told you about the aroma, it's got a nice sort of grainy, bready feel to it, a lot of grassy character as well though, with some kind of underlying citrusy feel to it, maybe just a little hint of caramel as well actually. Yeah. That bread, the bready malts are definitely a sort of um, caramel and uh, a, def a caramel grainy bread feel. It actually smells quite nice, and the grassy elements at the end are giving it that sort of fresh aroma, if you like. You can see the head is just kind of going down on this guy just now, but let's have a little look and see how we get on here. Very, actually, a very fresh. Uh, taste to this one and it is really really smooth it 
but yeah, it's given a really sort of good first impression, if you like, a very fresh beer, definitely very smooth. It actually follows the aroma, this one, quite well. You've got a nice grainy, bready malt base with just an underlying bit of caramel that gives that, that bread character just that nice little bit of brown sugary sweetness there. Yeah, definitely you've got just just a little hint of caramel. It just really has a very, very subtle underlying feature of this beer, but you've got it's definitely a kind of white bread with just a little bit of grainy cereal in there. Maybe even just a little hint of spice coming out of these grain flavours, in fact. But it's definitely a white bread malt base with just an underlying caramel and, uh, and grainy spice to it. On the end you're definitely getting the sort of grassy and citrusy hops, maybe even just a little bit of floral character to that actually, or floral aromatic character. Yeah, I would definitely go with that. It really is. It follows the aroma very, very well. Like I say, that white underlying caramel and, and grainy spice flavour on the opening there. It fades quite quickly and then it goes more into the hoppy bitterness. The hoppy bitterness is quite long lasting into the aftertaste and it's the grassy hops that are sticking with the tongue. And just a little bit of citrus kind of sticking in the middle of it there as well. But you can also pick up the bread that's lying into the aftertaste too. It's actually very well balanced in terms of the flavour and it kind of, it, it blends together really well which is quite interesting. But yeah, it's a very kind of well-balanced beer, if you like. So if you're into the Hellas beers, you know, give this guy a try. I think this is a really, in terms of the style of beer that it's going for, it's a really, really nice one. I don't, I honestly don't know if this is one, if this is the best beer that the that the brewery do. Of course, like I said, this is my first one from the brewery. So and, and I say, as I said, they're meant to be quite gifted at doing the Hefeweizen beers, but the, I can't really comment on that. But the uh, it's definitely for the Hellas style of beer. I actually think this is a really good one. But yeah, mouthfeel is it's very light bodied. It's not even pushing the sort of um, the light mid bodied character uh, category, if you like. It is a very light bodied beer. It's nice and crisp and quite refreshing. So it's a good summer beer, this guy. And um, it's actually got a, it's very, like I said before. It is a very very smooth beer, and it's it's just got the average carbonation, very soft and smooth carbonation that's typical of German beer. And it gets it's got a slightly dry mouthfeel. I would perhaps say just through just as you go through the flavour there, it becomes a bit drier on the finish. But at the same time, this beer does have the potential to be quite crisp and refreshing. So it's kind of a uh, it's got a little bit of everything. The bread malt base is really nice. The grassy hops have a nice long bitterness if you want a more hoppy style of beer. Maybe a bit reminiscent of the uh, of some of the Dortmund Hells beers actually. Usually the Münchner Hells are a bit more uh, are a bit more malty than uh, than the Dortmund Hells, but this guy is definitely a bit more of a hoppy beer in that in that in this case. But yeah, it's 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 a really good beer I think. And if you want to try another one of the breweries from Munich that will do the Oktoberfest beer. This is a probably a really good one to start with. It's a very sessionable beer. You can I can see myself being in Munich watching the World Cup or something like that and having a few of these during the game. It's really good for that sort of thing. A very sessionable beer and in the category of a Hellas beer I think it's actually very very well done. So give this guy a try. Check out the brewery website in the video description there. Hopefully you've enjoyed my beer review and found it, and found it informative. If you have tried it yourself please let me know in the comment section your own thoughts on this beer. Uh, this is the Hackerbschor Bra uh, Brau Munchner Hell. I hope you've enjoyed this beer review and please like, subscribe, share all the usual YouTube stuff and I'll be back soon with more German beer reviews. Cheers!